Okay, hello and welcome to our webinar this afternoon on language spoken in the UK. Um, and we're going to have presentations from Alita Nandi uh, of the University of Essex, um, from myself, and we've got a video we're going to try and play from Jemima Stockton. We haven't tried playing a video before in one of these webinars. Um, if it doesn't work, then we've got some slides that we can switch to. Um, I should say that this webinar is one in a series of webinars that have been run from representatives of a wide number of different data resources funded by the ESRC. Um, and all of the webinars in this series uh, have been recorded and are available on the UK Data Service YouTube channel. Uh, recently, we've had webinars on data about mental health, one last week on data about religion, and there's one next week on data about political behavior. So now I'd like to hand over to um, Alita Nandi, who's going to talk about data in understanding society. So as Ali said, I'm Alita Nandi. Um, thank you uh, for attending this webinar. I'm going to talk to you about the language questions that are there in understanding society. So before I tell you about the questions that are there, I'll tell you a little bit about the study itself. Now, so what is Understanding Society? It is a survey of UK households. These households have been randomly selected from across the UK. The survey collects information about all members of these sample households every year. So the same individuals are uh, interviewed repeatedly. Even if they move, they are followed as long as um, they are within the UK. Now, new members who join these households are also interviewed for as long as they live with the sampled members. So that is why it is a household longitudinal survey um, of UK. Now, what questions do we ask? So some questions are asked every year, while other questions are asked at regular intervals of two, three, or four years. But this allows researchers like you to understand how the lives of UK residents change over time and across their life course. But questions about respondents' past background, which will not change over time, like the country of birth or date of birth are asked only once. Finally, there are some questions which are triggered by certain events. So for example, if a respondent says that they have a child of the age of three, then certain questions get triggered about that three-year-old child. Now, so specifically what type of questions are asked? Now, all those who are 16 or above in these household households are considered to be adults for survey purposes and they are eligible for what we call adult interviews every year. Now, they are asked questions about almost every aspect of their lives. So in addition to information about age, sex, ethnic group, country of birth, they are asked about their family, their partnerships, children, family background, education, employment, income, health and well-being, attitudes and so on. So if you can think of an area we have covered it. But uh, those who are 10 to 15 year olds, uh, who are young people or adolescents, now they are also interviewed, but they get a much shorter questionnaire, and these are self-completion questionnaire, which they complete. And these questions deal with issues that are relevant to this age group, so about computer and social media usage, relationship with their family members, friends, dating behavior, health and happiness, bullying behavior. Now, one thing to note is we also collect information about zero to nine year olds, but they are not directly interviewed in this in the survey. The information about them is collected from their parents or guardians. Now in addition to the data that is collected directly from respondents uh, as part of the survey, there is additional data that you can match onto the survey data. One is at one point in time, after the second and third wave, nurses were sent to respondents' home for respondents who had given consent, and data was directly collected from respondents about um, their health and biomarkers, such as height, weight, grip strength, waist circumference, blood pressure, and so on. If you're interested in using that data, this is the link you should follow. Interviews also provide data about the quality of the interview and the interview process. Additionally, we provide information about respondents' residential location, 
so like the LSOA or the parliamentary constituency. And using that, you can then link to geography based data sets like the census, electoral information, and so on. So similarly, information about school locators are also provided, which you can then link to school data sets. And finally, uh, the National People Database has been linked to individuals in our survey who gave us consent and for whom we could match. So all these additionally linked data sets, if you need more information about that, you can follow this link. But in general, if you want to know more about the survey, you can go to our website. And here you can read about research that others have conducted using this study on different topics. You can read the user guide, the FAQs, questionnaires. You can search for variables. But if you still need more information, you can ask us. You can access our online Moodle training as well as attend our interactive virtual training sessions. And you can watch webinars like this, which would be recorded, and various training videos. So how to find out what questions are asked about the language? Now the easiest way to do this is to follow this link. And if you do that, it will take you to a page like this called Variable Search. In there, you can type language and it will bring up um, any variable which has the word language in its label, in its name, in the question text that it's linked to. So it will basically bring up all language related variables. Now, there are three purposes to collect language data in surveys. One is to measure language proficiency on a particular language. Second is to identify language-based ethnocultural groups. And, to th and the third is to know about the survey process, like which languages was uh, the respondent answering in, was the interview translated, and so on. So the first set of questions that we have are about language proficiency. Um, your respondents are asked uh, about English language, whether that is their first language. If they say no, then they're asked about the proficiency of English, but in various contexts. So when conducting day-to-day -day activities, when talking over the phone, when reading formal documents and letters and so on. Now this question was asked for the first time in grade one, the series of questions, and then they're asked at four-year intervals. Uh, similar questions are also asked on Welsh language proficiency. Now the second type of questions is the one which is could be used for measurement of ethnocultural groups. So in the second wave of the study, uh, respondents were asked what was the main language spoken at home during their childhood, and they could choose from a very long list of languages. Now as this is something that is not going to change over time, this is only asked once, and after wave two, only new entrants to the survey get asked this question. Now what we found, as expected, that 92% of respondents in wave 2 said that English was the main language spoken at home during childhood. Now this bar is not, I've not shown this bar because then all the other language bars would be so small you wouldn't be able to see it. Uh, but as you can see, English is followed by Punjabi, Bengali, Gujarati, and so on. And one thing to note is that English language spoken at home during childhood is not identical to migrant status. In fact, 38% of migrants said that they spoke English at home during their childhood. Another point to note is that the language spoken at home is also not identical to their self-reported ethnic group. So while 92% reported English as the main language, only 88% reported their ethnic group as white British. And as I said, the third reason um, for asking language-related questions is to understand the interview process. So there was, there's a series of questions where we ask, where we um, record whether the interview was um, translated from English. So we've allowed translations into nine languages. Some, uh, if that was not one of the languages that the interview was translated in, and the respondents wanted to answer in a different language, then sometimes someone in the household are translated for them. So all that information is recorded in the different variables, which you can find the way I showed you in search for them. 
Now there are a couple of other questions where language appears. So questions related to harassment, discrimination and identity also have a language component. For example, there's a series of questions which ask respondents whether in the last 12 months they were physically or verbally abused or attacked. If they say yes, they're asked why they thought that happened. And one of these options was because of their language or accent. Now, so if you wanted to know what kind of research has already been done using this particular data, you can go to our publications page, which will look like this. And then if you type on type language search, it will show you the list of publications uh, where language was used um, using understanding society data. But one thing you will notice right away is that um, unlike other topics, only 11 items were found. And basically that's because this is a very underused uh, part of our survey, this data. Uh, most of the papers that have uh, used this data have only used English as first language or English language proficiency variables. And most of them have looked at how English language proficiency affected ethnic minorities or migrant groups, labor market performance or economic outcomes. So the point that I wanted to make was that this is a really underused um, part of the survey, which means there's a lot of scope to do new research using this data. And that is the end of my talk. Thank you. Keep in touch with us. You can sign up for our newsletter, follow us on Twitter and Facebook, and also visit our YouTube channel where we have some of these webinars available and various training videos where you can know more about the survey. That's it. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Alita. So I'm going to talk about uh, questions about language that are in the census. Um, and then after that, we'll have our, our presentation from John Mimer that's about the census longitudinal studies. So I'm going to co concentrate on the parts of the census uh, other than the longitudinal studies. Um, so by, by, by way of background, um, I saw this tweet recently from GCHQ, and they said that there were 42 languages spoken across their workforce. And I thought that was quite a good place to start, because it kind of prompts the question of whether this is, is higher or lower or about the, the, the right amount that we might expect people to be speaking in, in a larger employer. And, and what do they mean by languages spoken? Do they mean that that's capability they have or uh, first languages that people have and so on? And a related question that arose from, from thinking about that is this one. Where is the most linguistically diverse place in the UK? And there are obviously sort of follow-on questions from that. What do we mean by this? What data can be used to answer this? And how easy is it to find an answer? And I want to concentrate on the what data can be used to answer this and what, we can, we, what can we learn from the census about linguistically uh, diverse places. So the census questions, um, the important thing to note is that they were different in different parts of the UK. There have been long-standing questions uh, in, on traditional languages in census, on the use of Welsh, or of Scottish Gaelic, of Irish, and of Ulster, Ulster Scots. And Jemima's presentation is going to pick up on, on some of that. In 2011, there were questions on uses of other languages. And this includes the main language used uh, at home or other languages used at home. And for people who indicated that their main language wasn't English, a question similar to the one in Understanding Society about proficiency in English. And on this slide, I'm showing the questions that were asked in the 2011 census on main language. And you can see that the questions asked in England and in Northern Ireland and in Wales were all the same. There was a question about whether your language was main language was English um, or in Wales whether your main language was Welsh or English and then if it was something else you were asked to write that language in. In Scotland a different question was asked. In Scotland the question was do you use a language other than English at home? And this doesn't say that it's your main language, it just says that it's an other language. 
So we might suspect that the results there will be slightly different because it's asking a different question. So how do we find data about this? Well, I used Infuse, which is one of the tools provided by UK Data Service. Um, and we'll show a, uh, I think I'll show a URL later on, but it's census.ukdataservice.ac.uk that you need to go to. And then you can browse a wide variety of census data. As I mentioned, the questions in England and Wales and Northern Ireland were different to the question in Scotland. And in browsing for data in Infuse, I was able to find a language or a table on main language used that's for which results are available in England and Northern Ireland and Wales. So I've just shown some screenshots on this slide of the process of selecting that table and selecting the cells within that table that I want to use and adding them to my planned output in the Infuse tool. Uh, I had to do a second run for data for Scotland, uh, reflecting the fact that a different question was asked in Scotland. And in both cases, in Infuse, um, one selects the variables of interest, the places for which I want to tabulate those results, and then I can download a CSV file and work with it uh, on my own computer. The results that are available vary quite a lot in terms of their detail. So the table on this slide show how many different languages are recognized in the results I was able to get from Infuse. So for, an Engl for England and Wales, and I was looking for results at ward level, there were 92 different languages that were tabulated that people may or may not use. In Scotland, there were just four. In Northern Ireland, 13. However, looking around on the Scotland Census website, I was able to find some additional tables as well. And the second of the one tables I've mentioned on this slide is the one I've used for my analysis. Um, it's showing languages used, uh, other languages used at home in Scotland by data zone. And in that case, there were 17 different languages uh, recognized in the results. That's a lot less than the 92 in the data for England and Wales, but is uh, much more detailed than the original four languages. So using those, I was able to join together various results. So tables in Infuse for different parts of the UK, tables for, that I got from uh, the scotlandcensus.gov.uk uh, for more detailed results in Scotland. I put them all together and I mapped them using boundaries from borders.ukdataservice.ac.uk and I managed to bring up a map like this. And this shows the number of languages spoken by at least 1% of the ward population in each ward. I used that as a fairly arbitrary cutoff. Um, I just wanted to find languages used by more than one or two people. I wanted to find languages used by some reasonable number of people. And the thing to notice about this map is that the results look very different in Scotland to the rest of the UK. And I think that's to do with the fact that a different question was asked in Scotland and the results are therefore not necessarily comparable. Again, a reminder that in Northern Ireland, we had the same question as that used in England and Wales but the range of result categories was a bit smaller. And this allows us to explore the question I posed at the beginning about linguistic diversity in the UK. Looking at the UK level map, we can see that there's an obvious cluster in London, and this map zooms in on London and shows the number of languages spoken in uh, wards in different parts, of different parts of London. But to answer the question about where was the most linguistically diverse place, if that concept really makes much sense? Well, the answer is that the city ward in Bradford was the ward with the largest number of different languages spoken by at least 1% of the population of the ward. Okay, so those results were using the uh, area statistics in the census. I also want to show uh, briefly uh, a set of results from the census microdata. There are a number of different microdata files. Uh, 
some are secure and there are strong access conditions on those. Some are safeguarded and they're available for use by academic researchers with, um, with much greater ease. They the safeguarded files are less detailed than the secure data files. So a brief summary here of the census microdata files that are available. For 2011, uh, there are files about individuals and files about households. The households data is only available in the secure setting. Um, but we have safeguarded data for 5% samples of the population of England and Wales and of Scotland and of Northern Ireland. If we look at the coding of those, that's, that's shown in this table. For the safeguarded data, there are nine different languages that we can see in England and Wales, 11 in Scotland, and 13 in Northern Ireland. Were you to use the secure data files, then there's a very, very wide range of different languages that are recorded. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, there's a question very similar to the one in Understanding Society about the proficiency of English for people who indicated that their main language wasn't English. And what we find, of course, at a national level from the, res from the results of that question is that for almost all languages, apart from a few with very small numbers of speakers, uh, the vast majority of people who say that their main language is whatever the language is, all, they also report good English proficiency. Um, one of the things we can do with microdata, of course, is to produce tabulations and cross tabulations that aren't available in the normal area statistics. So this graph shows the results for the question, how well can you speak English, uh, cross tabulated by the year of most recent arrival in the UK for people in England and Wales who were not born in the UK. So in this graph, um, the bluish uh, parts of the bar over on the right hand side are uh, responses saying that people did not speak English well. The orange parts of the bar are people who said that they did speak English well. And those colored parts are for people who said their main language wasn't English. The gray parts of the graph are for people who said uh, that their main language was English. So what we see is even for the most recent arrivals in the UK, the vast majority of people say that they speak English well or very well, or that their main language is English. As we look at uh, older parts of the graph, moving further down it, we see that fewer and fewer people uh, report problems speaking English, but also fewer people say that their English is it's uh, not their main language. The gray part of the graph is getting bigger the further back we look. More and more people, uh, as we look back in time, their main language in 2011 was English. Okay, so that brings me to the end of the slides on languages in the census, uh, data about languages in the census. What we're now going to try and do is uh, play a set of slides um, that Jemima Stockton recorded for us. We're going to skip over the um, descrip description of what the LSs are, they're available in other webinars, and we're going to look at some of the questions that have been asked about use of different languages in Celsius, in, in the longitudinal studies, in particular looking at questions about native language. Okay, so this is a summary for all of the parts of the UK, uh, and we can see that for questions about Welsh, they've been asked in the longitudinal study. They've been we have data about them in the longitudinal study from 1971 onwards. There's data about Scottish Gaelic from 1981 onwards in the Scottish LS, and data about use of uh, Irish languages in the Northern Ireland longitudinal study from 1991 onwards. Over on the right hand side, we can see that as well as the questions about native language use, there's also those questions I mentioned in the earlier slides about use of language. So now we're seeing a question from the census form in England and Wales. 
um, shown that there's a question about people's capability with English, sorry, with Welsh. Can you understand spoken Welsh, speak Welsh, read Welsh, write Welsh, or none of the above? The census form was, of course, available in Welsh as well for Welsh speakers. So similar sort of question in the quest census form in Scotland, although you can see that the question can be structured in a different way. And there's questions about whether or not you can understand, understand, speak, read, or write English, Scottish Gaelic, or Scots. Again, we see the questions on that we saw before on how well people can speak English. Um, and the question I showed before as well about whether you use a main language other than English at home. So in order to demonstrate um, how the Welsh uh, question can be used, um, what Jemima has done is taken some research that um, I did with Nicola Shelton, looking at the Welsh government policy of a million Welsh speakers by 2050, and looking at how we can use the Welsh language response, Welsh language questions in the LS uh, from 1971 onwards to try and explore how many people are able to speak Welsh and whether they retain that ability to speak Welsh as we look at multiple censuses 10 years apart. And we're focused here on two, decade, two, on two census points, 2001 and 2011. In that piece of work, we looked at multiple Welsh language capabilities, the ability to speak, to read, and to write Welsh. And we looked at people, whether people had one or more of those capabilities. And we looked at that both in 2001 and in 2011. And we divided people three ways, as shown on the table on the screen. People who retained an ability, people who gained an ability between two points, at the beginning they couldn't speak Welsh, at the second point they could, or people who indicated the loss of an ability over that 10-year period. So this graph shows the odds for gaining Welsh language capability of speaking or reading or writing uh, over time. And we can see at the bottom part of this graph quite a strong variation by the number of co-resident speakers in the household. The more co-resident speakers, co-resident Welsh speakers that you live with, the more likely you are to gain a capability uh, to read, speak, or write Welsh. These are the odds ratios for attaining Welsh language. So people had one or more capability at the beginning of the decade, and they still had one or more capability at the end of the decade. It's possible that that capability could have changed mode. They could have changed from reading to writing, but I think that's fairly unlikely. So we see um, an increase with age, although obviously the error bars on that overlap quite strongly for, for some of those periods. So after adjusting for uh, socioeconomic status, uh, the odds for gaining Welsh language compared with not gaining it um, were raised for women compared to men, for people with qualifications compared to those with no qualifications, and for people who lived with three or more co-resident Welsh speakers. Um, when we say three co-resident Welsh speakers, we're talking about other people in the same household. The odds were lower for people who were separated or divorced compared to the never married or partnered. Um, lower for the married compared to the never married. Using the LS, we are able to look at people who are living in English who indicated that Welsh was their main language. And there's a slight oddity in the census data in this regard. If you live in England, you were asked whether your main language was English or other, and you could write Welsh in the other part of that. If you lived in Wales, you were asked whether your main language was English or Welsh. And so you couldn't easily on that question indicate that you spoke Welsh primarily. Primarily, Some people did write Welsh 
in as the other response, and that was recorded in the LS data. Um, we concluded that many people in English reported a ability to use uh, to have Welsh as their main language, and this was more likely if they were previously resident in Wales for at least two censuses. We were able to look at how many resident, how many times people had previously been in Wales for a census prior to being resident in England, and we thought, in terms of policy, it would be easier to achieve that Welsh speaking goal if we include Welsh speakers in England as well as the Welsh speakers in in Wales, and of course Welsh speakers in England may move back to Wales over time. Uh, Jemima is just showing here in the slides some examples of previous studies using language uh, that use LS data. Um, so differential factors, driving geographic variation in mortality. Um, in Scotland versus England and Wales, ethnic identification amongst immigrants and their descendants across multiple generations, ethnic migration and mobility, some work on immigration and language spoken, and on neighbourhood and social integration. If you want to use the LS data, and of course it's not just the LS in England and Wales, it's the LS in Scotland and in Northern Ireland as well, you can go to calls.ac.uk, which has information about all three studies.